Good evening. It's good to be in the cradle of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're not strangers to this area. I've been at Fresno Central Church for about 16 years. And we make it a point about every four years to organize a tour and invite our church members to come and visit this area of the country. Uh, since I've been there, we've uh, actually had three tours uh, to this area. We begin in Washington, D.C. and visit the General Conference headquarters. And then uh, we take the CUC bus up the East Coast, visiting New York, and then coming up into New England, visiting places like the Washington, New Hampshire Church, uh, Gorham, where Ellen White was born, the Miller Farm, among other places in this area. And then we continue on the bus up to Niagara Falls. And then we go across to Michigan and end up at Battle Creek. And then, of course, we take the bus to Chicago, and then we go back to Fresno from Chicago. We've done this uh, three times, and next October is our next trip to this area. Uh, our church members have all said that it's a life-changing experience to come to this area and just remember all of the denominational, his denominational history that took place here. This is certainly the cradle of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I believe that where the work began with great power, it will also end with great power. It might not appear so right now, but soon great changes according to the spirit of prophecy are going to take place. And when those changes take place, people's hearts are going to open, and people's minds are going to open. And uh, these regions uh, are going to be very open to the preaching of the special message for, that God has for this period of human history. And we're all hoping and praying for those days. Now I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask the Lord's special guidance in our study. Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be in your presence. What a joy it is to be at camp meeting. Remind us, reminds us of the good old camp meetings that took place at the beginning of the history of the Adventist church, even before, during the Millerite movement. Tent meetings that took place right in this area. Father, we thank you that we're still able to gather in freedom to praise your name, to keep your holy Sabbath, and to open your holy word. We ask, Father, that you will help us not to take this privilege for granted. We ask that you will bless us as we open with reverence the pages of your holy book. I ask, Lord, that you will open minds and hearts, give us understanding and the willingness to go out and proclaim it to the world. And we thank you, Father, for being with us and for answering our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Almost a year ago, to the day, many of us were in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Georgia Dome. And there, Elder Ted Wilson, newly elected president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, preaching before a crowd of around 70,000 people, from all over the world, presented his inaugural, inaugural address to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In an impassioned appeal, Elder Wilson called the Seventh-day Adventist Church to return to its roots and to pray for revival and reformation above everything else. Because without revival and reformation, Jesus will not come. Now there's one aspect of revival and reformation that I would like to address 
which Elder Wilson did not directly address, but Ellen White certainly does. And I'd like to begin by reading a couple of statements from the writings of Ellen White, where she speaks about this specific prerequisite for revival and reformation. You know, usually we talk about prayer and we talk about Bible study and the importance of making a total commitment to the Lord, placing our resources at the disposal of God's church. All of these things are elements of revival and tomorrow in my sermon I'm going to speak about these elements. But this evening I would like to speak about one element which is not touched upon very frequently. The first statement that I want to read is from the book Testimonies to Ministers, page 113. Here Ellen White is speaking about the book of Revelation. And this is what she says. When we as a people understand what this book means to us, there will be seen among us a great revival. How many of you had ever thought that the study of Revelation would bring a great revival? That's what she's saying. Once again, when we as a people understand what this book means to us, there will be seen among us a great revival. And then she says, we do not understand fully the lessons that it teaches, notwithstanding the injunction given us to search and study it. The second statement is just as significant. Here Ellen White is speaking not only about Revelation, she's also speaking about Daniel. In other words, Daniel and Revelation. This is found also in Testimonies to Ministers, page 114. And this is how it reads. When the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. Are you wanting that experience? Yes. I know I do. So she says, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience they will be given such glimpses of the open gates of heaven now listen carefully that heart and mind will be impressed with the character that all must develop in order to realize the blessedness which is to be the reward of the pure in heart powerful statement so in these two statements, Ellen White is telling us that one of the key elements of revival and reformation is an understanding of Bible prophecy, specifically Daniel and Revelation. But of course, the question that begs to be answered is this. Why is a study of prophecy so important in revival and reformation? What makes the study of Bible prophecy indispensable, in fact, for a revival and reformation? This evening, I would like to give you an example of how important the understanding of Bible prophecy is in a tremendous revival and reformation. What we're going to do is go back to apostolic times. We're going to discuss what happened on the day of Pentecost. And we're going to see how prophecy was crucially important for that revival and reformation. Ellen White has told us that many of the prophecies that were fulfilled on the day of Pentecost will be fulfilled again when God's Spirit is poured out in the latter rain. Now, as we read the four Gospels, one thing comes out very clearly. And that is that until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
The disciples were totally oblivious and totally misunderstood the mission and the ministry of Jesus Christ. In fact, I want to present three examples of how the followers of Jesus totally missed the point about what Jesus had come to do. The first example is found in John chapter 12 and verse 16. This is speaking about what happened on what Christians call Palm Sunday. You know Palm Sunday is actually a commemoration of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. You remember that he sat on a donkey and uh, people would uh, place uh, different branches of trees in, in the, on the road and they proclaimed Jesus as the King, as the Messiah. And of course the leaders in this movement were the disciples. But the disciples really didn't understand what they were doing. We're told in John chapter 12 and verse 16, His disciples did not understand these things at first. Here they're proclaiming Jesus King, they're shouting, Hosanna in the highest to the King, and they don't understand what they're doing. John continues saying, But when Jesus was glorified, that happened at the day of Pentecost, by the way, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. When did they come to understand the true meaning of the triumphal entry? When Jesus was what? When Jesus was glorified on the day of Pentecost, then they understood. While Jesus was going into Jerusalem triumphantly, they had no idea what was happening. Now I'd like to mention our second example. On resurrection morning, Jesus met up with Mary in the garden. Actually, before he met, uh, she met Jesus, or Jesus met her, we find uh, two angels there present with Mary, and the angels ask Mary, Woman, why are you weeping? And what was Mary's answer? She said, because they have taken away my Lord. This is John 20 and verse 13. Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Did Mary understand what Jesus had done? Did Mary understand that Jesus had resurrected from the dead? Absolutely not. She's crying because she says, they've taken away my Lord. She's oblivious to the idea that Jesus has resurrected from the dead. And then a little bit later that day, Jesus catches up with a couple of his followers that were on the road to Emmaus. We all know the story. Jesus caught up with them and began to talk with them. And in Luke chapter 24 and verse 21, one of these individuals said something that shows the deep, deep grief that they had suffered because the Messiah had not panned out as they thought he was going to. Luke 24 and verse 21. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, Today is the third day since these things happened. We thought he was the Redeemer. So the disciples did not understand the triumphal entry. Mary did not understand why Jesus wasn't in the tomb. And the disciples on the road to Emmaus said, we hoped that this would be the man who would redeem Israel. They totally missed the reason of why Jesus came to this earth. Now if I were to ask you why Jesus came to this world, why he came to live here for three and a half years and to die, I probably would get many different answers and there are many reasons why Jesus came. But there are two primary reasons why Jesus came to this earth and they have to do with two places in the Hebrew sanctuary. The first place is the camp. Usually when we study the sanctuary, we don't 
say much about the camp we begin in the court with the altar of sacrifice. That's a mistake to start at the altar of sacrifice. Because before Jesus went to the cross, to the altar of sacrifice, he lived in our midst for three and a half years. You see, Jesus came to the camp and he dwelt with us. That could be translated, he pitched his tent with us. And Jesus faced the devil. He tempted Jesus with everything that we are tempted with. And yet Jesus never sinned. Now why did Jesus come and live his perfect sinless life? There's a very special reason. You see the law of God demands absolute perfection. It says obey and live. Disobey in the least and die. How many people in this world have rendered what the law requires perfectly? Anyone here tonight? Want to raise your hand? If you rose your hand, that would be the first sin that you've committed. <laughs> because you're bearing false witness. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no not one. So if the law demands perfection and we can't give the law perfection, how is it possible then that we can be found not guilty? The answer is that Jesus, when he came to this world to live in our midst, he came to live the life that all of us should live. He came to live in our place. He came to do battle with the devil and to gain the victory where we fail. So that if we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, if we repent and confess our sins and show sorrow for sin and trust in his merits, Jesus can take his perfect life, which he lived in our midst, and place it to our account. But we had another problem. And this is why Jesus goes to the court. You see, it wasn't sufficient for Jesus to live the life that we should live because somebody had to pay for the sins that we've committed. Somebody had to pay the debt of our sin. And so after living his perfect life in our place, Jesus now goes into the court and he dies on the cross or at the altar also in our place. In other words, Jesus came to this world to live the life that we should live and he came to this world to die the death that we should die. So that if we trust in him, if we repent and confess our sins and have sorrow for sin and trust in the merits of Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm a miserable sinner. I deserve to be doomed and condemned. But Jesus, I trust in you. Please take your life, take your death and place them to my account. Jesus will do that and God will look upon me as if I had never sinned because he looks at me in Jesus. Amen. Is that good news? That's wonderful news. Praise the Lord for those amens. You know, pastors like two noises in church. And one of them is not the cell phone. <laughs> the first noise that we like is, is to hear the pages of the Bible turning. That's music. At least music to my ears. And the second noise is for you to say amen or hallelujah once in a while if something touches your heart. The Pentecostals do not have a monopoly over the word amen or over the word hallelujah. It can be freely used because in heaven the angels say amen and hallelujah. Let me ask you, did the disciples, did the followers of Jesus understand these reasons why Jesus came? Did they understand that Jesus came to live the life that all should live and he came to die the death that all should die? They did not understand it. They were saddened. We thought he was going to redeem Israel. We thought he was going to sit on the throne as king. They didn't get it. Now the question is, when and how did the disciples or the followers of Jesus come to understand why Jesus came to this earth? What method was used to show them why Jesus had come so that they could understand? The answer, folks, is that they understood it through a study of Bible prophecy. Go with me to Luke 24. 
Luke 24 and verse 25. Once again, these are the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus catches up to them. And Jesus says something very interesting to them. He says, O foolish ones, and slow of heart, now listen carefully, to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Where was their mistake? They did not understand what? They did not understand prophecy. O foolish ones, and slow of heart, to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then notice what Jesus does. This is in Luke chapter 24, verses 26 and 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. How did they come to understand what Jesus had come to do? By a study of what? By a study of Bible prophecy. A little later, Jesus comes back to Jerusalem, and he meets with the disciples in the upper room. And we find the same thing all over again. Notice Luke chapter 24, and verses 44 and 45. Now Jesus is with the disciples in the upper room. There they're saddened and they're hiding for fear of the Jews. See, they, they don't know what the two disciples on the road to Emmaus knew at this point. Notice what Jesus says in Luke 24, 44 and 45. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. That all things, listen carefully, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then we're told immediately afterwards, he opened their understanding that they might what? That they might comprehend the scriptures. How did they come to understand what Jesus had come to do? They understood it by a new comprehension of Bible prophecy according to what we find here in Luke chapter 24. And then in Luke 24 verse 46, Jesus said, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And so now the disciples say, Aha! Now that we look at prophecy, we understand what he came to do. He came to live and he came to die. He certainly was the one who came to redeem Israel. But now listen carefully to what I'm going to say. Not only did they understand what Jesus had come to do, but Jesus opened to them also prophecies about what he was about to do. He explained prophecies about what Jesus was about to do just a few weeks later. Notice Luke 24 and verses 47 and 48. Here Jesus is going to speak about their message and their mission. See, they understand first of all what Jesus came for. He came to live his life and he came to die, death for sin. And now Jesus is going to say, in the light of understanding this now, I'm going to tell you what your message is and I'm going to tell you what your mission is. Did they have to understand Bible prophecy to know what their message and mission was? Yes. Of course. Let's notice it. Luke 24, 47 and 48. And we'll start at verse 46 because it has the context. We just read it a moment ago. Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. That's what Jesus had already fulfilled. But now notice. Listen carefully. And that repentance and remission, the word, don't get confused with the word remission. It means forgiveness. It's the identical word that is translated forgiven in the New Testament. The word aphesis. It's just translated in the King James Version remission, but it's forgiveness. And so it says, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be what? Oh, now we know 
about the message should be preached in His name. Where? To all nations, beginning where? At Jerusalem. Do we have the message and the mission there in that verse? What is the mission? The mission is to take the message to all nations. And what is the message? That repentance and what? And remission or forgiveness of sins should be preached. What was the message of the apostles? The message of the apostles was that now people could repent and receive what? And receive forgiveness for sins. And that message had to be carried where? To all nations. That was the mission. So now the disciples understood what Jesus had done. And now they knew what their message was and what their mission was. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Don't answer it quickly. Because <laughs> usually most Adventists, at least where I've preached, have answered the question wrong. Because we're kind of fuzzy on our view of salvation and even of the sanctuary. Did Jesus forgive everyone's sins at the cross? If I ask that question in a non-Adventist church, the unanimous answer would probably be yes. And in many Adventist churches where I preached the answer, people immediately say, yes, he did. But the fact is, folks, that Jesus did not forgive individuals' sins at the cross. He made provision so that they could be forgiven when you come to Him. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. Why does the Bible say, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to what? Yes. To forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our righteousness. Why would he say that if our sins were already forgiven at the cross? The fact is, folks, that sin was not forgiven at the cross. Jesus made provision at the cross for the forgiveness of sin. But you have to come personally and individually to claim what Jesus did by his perfect life and what Jesus did through his death on the cross. You may, must make his life and his death your own by faith. Amen. So what was the preaching of the disciples? The preaching of the disciples were very simple. They went to all nations and they said, let, let us tell you what Jesus did. <laughs> and I believe that during the 40 days in, that Jesus spent with the disciples after his resurrection, do you remember what Jesus did during those 40 days? It says in Acts chapter 1 verse 3 that he spoke to his disciples about the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I believe that during those 40 days they went to the seminary. <laughs> and Jesus opened prophecy to them. And I believe that some of those prophecies were for example the Passover. Jesus said, hey, what day did I die? In month, oh, the 14th of Nisan. And what hour did I die? at the ninth hour. And what year did I die? The year 31. He says, now what prophecies of the Old Testament can you think of that pointed to that exact time frame? The Passover. The 14th of Nisan between the two evenings. That is, would be at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the ninth hour. And the prophecy of the 70 weeks said that in the middle of the last seven years, Messiah would be cut off. How could we miss it? And then by looking at the prophecy of the 70 weeks, he said, how soon before I died on the cross, or how much before I died on the cross, was I baptized? And did I begin my earthly ministry? Well, it was three and a half years, wasn't it? Jesus said, can you think of a prophecy that was fulfilled exactly three and a half years before he died? They say, ah, after 69 weeks the Messiah would be anointed. Daniel chapter 9. And then Jesus says, what day did I rest in the tomb? And what happened with my body? They say, well, your body didn't see corruption. You rested in the tomb all day Sabbath. And Jesus said, what feast came after the Passover? 
the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus rested in the tomb on the unleavened bread and his body saw no corruption because he had no leaven in him. He had no sin in him. Say, wow, they're saying we get it now. And then Jesus, what happened after the first day of unleavened bread? The very next day. They say, well, you resurrected from the dead. And what feast in the Hebrew religious system would represent the resurrection? Well, the day, the day after the first day of unleavened bread was the first fruits. And Jesus, oh, we get it. You resurrected the first fruits. Because you live, we shall live also. And so Jesus says, look, I lived the life that you should live. I died. I was buried. I resurrected. And now your message is to take this, this message to the world and let everyone know what I have done. That was their message. And that was their mission. They couldn't do this unless they understood the prophecies of the Bible. And by the way, interestingly enough, Jesus also explained to the disciples what he was going to do on the day of Pentecost, which had not been fulfilled yet. In fact, let's go to the day of Pentecost, but before we do, I want to read again Luke 24, 47 and 48. Luke 24, 47 and 48. We just read it, but let's read it again. It has the message and mission of the disciples. It says there, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, how could they proclaim that? Did they need special power to proclaim that? Of course. They couldn't do it on their own. Verse 48. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So he says, here's your message, here's your mission, and 50 days from now you will have the power to fulfill the mission and to preach the message. And exactly the way prophecy contemplated, the next Hebrew feast was Pentecost. <laughs> fifty days after first fruits. Pentecost took place fifty days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the disciples are thinking, right on schedule. He died at the exact date. He came and was baptized at the exact date. He was buried as the unleavened bread at the exact date. He resurrected at the exact date. Now it's fifty days later. And it's the Feast of Pentecost. Do you think that the disciples understood what was going to happen at the day of Pentecost? You better believe they did. How did they know what was going to happen on the day of Pentecost? Because they understood what? Prophecy. prophecy. Could they have understood, have understood what their message was without understanding Bible prophecy? Could they have understood what their mission was without understanding Bible prophecy? Could they understand what God had in store for them without understanding what Jesus had done and what Jesus was about to do in the light of Bible prophecy? Absolutely not. The study of prophecy was indispensable. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. It's a phenomenal sermon and I'm not going to read all of the verses. I'm just going to give you an overview so that you can understand the content of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Peter understood, folks. He understood what Jesus had done and what Jesus was about to do. The first thing that Peter does in his sermon is quote Joel chapter 2 and verses 28 to 32. Is that a Bible prophecy? Absolutely. And he says, you think it's surprising that you have tongues of fire and you have, and you have a, a mighty rushing wind and people are speaking in other tongues? He says, you shouldn't be surprised at that because there's a prophecy in the Old Testament that said this was going to happen. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters and your maidens will prophesy. He says, and that's, that's happening right now here on earth. But then Peter transitions in his sermon. See, most people focus on what happened on earth on the day of Pentecost. In fact, almost all churches 
the Adventist church included, you know, we focus on what happened on earth. Oh yeah, there was a mighty rushing wind and there, was, there were tongues like the, as a fire and speak, people spoke, the followers of Jesus spoke in other languages and we focus so much on what happened on earth that we don't realize that the important event took place in heaven. And what happened on earth was only an announcement of what actually transpired in heaven. And Peter caught this. Because after Peter quotes Joel 2, 28 to 32, where he explains why this is happening on earth, then Peter goes on and listen to the order. He goes on to speak in Acts 2, 23. He says, Jesus went about performing miracles, wonders, and signs among the people. That's his life. Then in verse 23, Peter says, and then he was killed. That is, he died. In verse 24, he says, then Jesus what? Resurrected. Are you catching the sequence? First is life. Miracles, wonders, and signs. Verse 22. Verse 23, it says, you killed him. He was killed. He died. And then in verse 24, he resurrected. And interestingly enough, Peter, when he goes over these aspects of the ministry of Christ, he quotes three scriptures from the Old Testament. Did Peter understand Bible prophecy now? Oh, you better believe he did. I'm going to tell you which prophecies he quoted. Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10. Peter quoted that passage. It was a prophecy about the day of Pentecost. That God would not leave Jesus in the grave, nor would he allow his Holy One to see corruption. He quotes Psalm 16 and verses 8 through 10. And then he quotes Psalm 110 verse 1. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He's focusing their eyes where now? He's focusing their eyes on heaven. In fact, he uses this passage that I mentioned before from Psalm 16. He says that the, brave, the grave could not contain Jesus. And that Jesus ascended to the heavens because the grave could not contain Jesus Christ. And then also Peter alludes to the prophecy of 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13, where we're told that from the seed of David, God would raise up one that would sit on the throne. And so what, how is Peter explaining what is happening on the day of Pentecost? He's taking Bible prophecy and he's saying, this that you see happening on earth, Joel chapter 2. But what's happening on earth is really a repercussion of something that happened in heaven. Jesus was enthroned next to his father. The grave could not contain him. He's in heaven now. Just like the promise of 2 Samuel chapter 7 had said. Now let me ask you, did this understanding of Bible prophecy lead to a tremendous revival? Did the disciples know where they came from? Did they know why they were there? And what they needed to do? Absolutely. They knew what their origin was. They knew exactly what was happening then and what their mission and message was. Could they have known any of this unless they had understood Bible prophecy? Absolutely not. And so the disciples now go out, listen carefully, and in one generation, the gospel is taken to the entire Roman world. Because they had their mandate. They knew exactly what to preach. They understood their past. They understood their present, and they understood the future in the light of Bible prophecy. They knew where they came from, they knew why they were there, and they knew what their mission was to the world. And basically now their message was simply to tell the whole world that the sanctuary was open for business. <laughs> you know, when Peter finished his sermon, interestingly enough, you know, Peter didn't have to make a call. Amen. The Holy Spirit was so powerful that when Peter finishes his sermon, a whole multitude of those who were present come up to the rush up to Peter. Don't we wish this would happen in evangelism? <laughs> well, probably what's lacking is the Holy Spirit. 
the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. So they come up to Peter and they say, what do we need to do in the light of what you've preached? Notice Peter's answer. Do you remember in Luke chapter 24 what Jesus said their message was? That's supposed to preach what? Repentance and what? And forgiveness of sins in all nations. Remember that? Now, is that what Peter preached? Notice Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. He says to them, repent. Is that part of the message that Jesus gave? Repent, and now listen carefully. And let every one of you, what does that indicate, every one of you? Is this a corporate thing or is it an individual thing? Last I knew, every one is individual. Every one. Each one. You see, the work that Jesus did in the camp and in the court was corporate. He did it for the whole world. But we must come individually to claim it. That's what Peter is saying. He's saying, repent. And that every one of you be baptized. Do you know what happens at baptism? We haven't fully understood even what baptism means. You know, we think that in baptism, you know, we die to our old self and we resurrect to a new life. That's true. But the significant aspect of baptism is not us. It's Christ. Because you know what happens at baptism? It's at baptism that I symbolically am buried with Christ and I resurrect with Christ. In other words, when, when a person goes into the waters and comes out of the water, now the Father looks at that person and says, I don't see you anymore. I see Jesus because you're included in Him. Because you died and resurrected with Him. And God could not have chosen a better symbol than baptism for this. You know, you've seen baptisms. The pastor's in the tank and the person is in front. He says, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What is the last thing the person does before they're put under the water? They stop breathing. What's the last thing you do before you die? You stop breathing. And then they're put under the water. What do they do while they're under the water? They're still not breathing, we hope. <laughs> what happens when a person is dead under the earth? Not breathing. What's the first thing that the person does when he comes out of the water? Breath. <sighs> Breathe again. Are you seeing that in baptism, I'm included in Christ? God reckons me dead with Him, buried with Him, and resurrected with Him, and now I am accepted in the Beloved. That's what Peter is saying. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for what, re what reason? For the remission of sins. And then he says to them what? Ha! <laughs> You'll receive the remission of sins, but then he says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why would they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? What would be the purpose? Why did the disciples receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? You know, there's this idea among Christians that, that God gave the Holy Spirit for self-edification. The Holy Spirit was not poured out on the day of Pentecost for self-edification. The Holy Spirit was poured out to give power to witness. That's the, that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So Peter is saying, you see us preachers? We repented. We were baptized. We resurrected to newness of life. And we receive forgiveness of sins. He says, but now God wants you to have what we had. He wants you to repent. He wants you to be buried in the waters of baptism. And He wants you to resurrect to newness of life. And He wants to give you the Holy Spirit to preach with power as He gave it to us to preach to you. Are you following me? And the disciples literally, almost literally, set the world of that day and age on fire. 
They won others, and those others won others, and those others won others, until the gospel went to the whole world in that generation. They had a powerful message because they understood the message in the light of Bible prophecy. Is it just possible that the only way that Adventists can proclaim the message to the world that God has for the world is by understanding prophecy? Not the same prophecies, but other prophecies that have to do with the most holy place. We'll come back to that in a few moments. Now go with me to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 and verses 30 to 32. Acts 5 verses 30 to 32. I want to show you this pattern. Repentance, baptism, and then reception of the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness of sins and reception of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5 verse 30. Listen to the sequence. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus. That's his resurrection, right? Whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. That's his what? His death. Him God has exalted where? To his right hand to be prince and savior. You see in the sequence? Death, resurrection, seated at the right hand of God. Now why is he seated at the right hand of God? Let's continue reading. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. Now listen carefully. To give what? Why would they have to repent after the day of Pentecost if all the sins were forgiven at the cross? To give repentance to Israel and what else? And forgiveness of sins. That the same thing that we found Jesus telling the disciples in the upper room? The same thing that was said by Peter in his sermon on the day of Pentecost? Absolutely. And then notice, and we are his witnesses to these things as so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. Let's go to one more passage. Same sequence. Acts chapter 10. And I'm only going to read verse 43, but I'll tell you what comes immediately before. In verses 37 and 38 of Acts chapter 10, we find Peter describing Jesus as going forth and doing good. There you have his life. Then in verses 39 to 41, we have Peter saying that Jesus died and he resurrected. And now notice verse 43. The apostle Peter said that to Jesus all the prophets witnessed that through his name, whoever what? Whoever believes in him will receive what? remission of sins. There it is again. So what was the message of the apostles? The message of the apostles was very simple folks. It is that Jesus was now in heaven as the high priest and people could come and they could claim the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus as their own through repentance and through faith in Jesus Christ. That was present truth for them. That was their message. Could they proclaim that message if they had not understood Bible prophecy? Could they know what their mission was if they did not understand Bible prophecy? Absolutely not. You see, when they understood what the message was and what the mission was, they set the world on fire. Now listen to what I'm going to say. How did the church of that day and age respond to the message of the disciples? How did the Jewish church respond to the message of the disciples? Let me ask you, had, had the Jewish leaders followed Jesus to the camp, did they understand what Jesus had done at the camp? No. Did they understand what Jesus had done at the court? Could they understand what Jesus was doing in heaven? No. They couldn't. The established church of that day and age was left in darkness because they did not follow the steps of the ministry of Jesus in the sanctuary. Because they did not understand the prophecies about what Jesus had done and was doing. In fact, let me read you this statement from Ellen White, Early Writings, pages 259 and 260. Very significant statement. 
Ellen White explains the rending of the veil of the temple showed that the Jewish sacrifices and ordinances would no longer be received. The great sacrifice had been offered and had been accepted. And the Holy Spirit which descended on the day of Pentecost carried the minds of the disciples from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly. Now listen carefully. Where Jesus had entered by his own blood to shed upon his disciples the benefits of his atonement. What did Jesus go to heaven to do? To shed upon his disciples, not the whole world, upon his disciples what? The benefits of, what were the benefits of his atonement? Simply, the benefits of his atonement are his perfect life and his death for sin. In other words, disciples are saying, you all are sinners, you all deserve death. But if you, if you repent of your sins and you trust in Jesus Christ and you're baptized and you're included in him, he will take his life and his death and he will place them to your own individual personal account and you will no longer be in debt. You will be looked upon by God as if you had never sinned. Was that good news? But now notice what she continues saying. But the Jews were left in total darkness. Why were they left in darkness? Did they understand Bible prophecy? Did they follow Jesus to the court and to the camp and to the holy place? Absolutely not. But the Jews were left in total darkness. They lost all the light which they might have had upon the plan of salvation and still trusted in their useless sacrifices and offerings. The heavenly sanctuary had taken the place of the earthly yet they had no knowledge of the change. Therefore, they could not be benefited by the mediation of Christ in the holy place. Folks, I'm sure that the disciples longed for the Jewish leaders and the members of the Jewish church to accept, to understand prophecy and to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I'm sure that they would have preferred to not start a new movement. They wanted to save the institutional church of that day and age. That was their longing, that was their desire. And yet what did the church of that day and age do when the, this message that God gave was proclaimed by the disciples? They were persecuted. Is this story going to be repeated? Yes. Yes. But with prophecies concerning the second coming of Christ, misunderstood by the religious world. And because the Jewish church refused to follow Jesus, to understand Bible prophecy, and accept the message of the disciples, the disciples called them out. It was not politically correct to call them out of the established church. But they had to do it. Because the church of that day and age was fallen. And notice what happened when they called people out of that apostate church. Acts 6 and verse 7 says, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And then we're told also in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 that 3,000 souls were baptized and that day they joined the Christian church. And we're told in Acts chapter 4 and verse 4 a few days later 5,000 came out of the apostate system and joined God's church of that day and age who had the present truth message. Now listen carefully to what I'm going to say because there's a very interesting parallel between back then and now. Do you know that the message of the disciples was actually two-pronged? You say, what do you mean two-pronged? Well, the first message that they needed to deliver was to the church, right? Weren't they supposed to start in Jerusalem and Judea first? So they were to preach first of all to the church. 
But then who also were they supposed to preach to? The unchurched. Can you imagine them saying, no, 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 we, we just, let's forget the church. Let's not, let's not call those people to come out of this apostate system. Let's go reach the unchurched. That's something that's being said today even in the Adventist church. You know, let's focus on the seekers. I'm not saying that that's bad. Because the disciples went all over the Roman Empire to the unchurched. But they also had a mission to the church. To those who had not understood prophecy and accepted prophecy. They needed to preach Bible prophecy so that they could come out and they could be members of God's remnant people. Now let me conclude by saying this. Are, are you seeing some parallels here? Has God given tremendous prophecies about the second coming of Christ? He most certainly has. He's going to come visibly. He's going to come gloriously. His coming is going to be with a lot of noise. Every eye will see Him. The Bible's clear. But now, how do most people understand, those who are churched, understand the second coming of Christ? It's going to be secret. Only some will see it. Only the church will be removed to heaven. And everybody else will be left behind to have another opportunity to be saved. And then they say the Antichrist is going to kick in. Interesting. Do you know that Protestantism today and Roman Catholicism, if I can be bold here, their system of interpreting prophecy is known as preterism and futurism. Basically, preterism teaches that the Antichrist prophecies apply to a nasty individual who lived 165 years before the birth of Christ called Antiochus Epiphanes. So they say the Antichrist prophecy, by the way, these are liberal Protestants and Roman Catholics are preterists. They say, we don't bother to study about those Antichrist prophecies because those were already fulfilled with uh, Antiochus Epiphanes who desecrated the Jewish temple and sacrificed a pig on the altar. But then you have the conservative wing of Protestantism. They say, no, no, the Antichrist prophecies have not been fulfilled yet. After the rapture of the church, the Antichrist is going to sit in the rebuilt Jewish temple in the Middle East. And so everybody's looking to the past and looking to the future. And they can't see that the Antichrist ruled for over a thousand years. From Rome. Because they're looking in the wrong place. Will this determine whether you follow the Antichrist or not? It will determine if you don't understand it. If you don't understand what the mark of the beast is, the image of the beast is, you will end up worshiping the beast and receiving his mark. And the Protestant world is oblivious to these prophecies. And let me conclude by making this remark, which is very, very important. Where is Jesus today? Is Jesus in the, in the camp today? No. Is he in the court? No. Is he in the holy place? No. Where is he? In the most holy place. Now don't misunderstand me. When you're witnessing to people, you start in the camp. Don't start in, with the Sabbath. See, the sanctuary shows us how to do evangelism. You start with Jesus coming and living the life that we should live and His perfection and His beauty. And then you say, in, fa in spite of the fact that He was perfect and He was beautiful, He was disfigured because of our sins. Wow. And people say, well, how can I benefit from what He did? Well, He's in heaven interceding for you right now. If you come in repentance and confession and you trust in Him, He'll take His life and His death and put them to your account. But we can't stop there. Because Jesus is not in the holy, he's in the most holy. What do we find in the most holy place? The distinctive teachings of the Adventist church. In the most holy place you have the law. The Sabbath. 
the idea of the judgment. And by the way, the state of the dead is there too. Say, so how's the state of the dead there? Listen, if the judgment began in 1844, and the first person to be judged was Adam, then Adam did not go to heaven or to hell when he died, because he wouldn't have gone there before he was judged. So he must have been dead until his name come up in 1844. Are you with me or not? You see, in the Christian world, the judgment, the judgment makes no sense. Because in the Christian world, they say, when you die, if you were good, you go to heaven. If you were bad, you go to hell. So why would God judge you? The judgment takes place at death. But the Adventist idea of the judgment is totally different. And that is that we all stand before the judgment bar of God through the record of our life. To, sh to reveal before the universe whether our repentance was genuine and real or not. And do you know what the Most Holy Place also teaches? By the way, are those the doctrines that are going to be the co doctrines in conflict at the end of time? The law? Yes, the Sabbath? The state of the dead? Absolutely. Healthful living is in the Most Holy Place also. You say, how's healthful living there? Remember the pot of manna? God gave manna to teach healthful living. And it's there in the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. And by the way, Jesus is cleansing the, the sanctuary from the sins of his people. And Ellen White says that while he's cleansing the sanctuary above, we should be doing a parallel work through the work of the Holy Spirit. We should be cleansing the sanctuary of the soul because he will not cleanse anything there that has not been cleansed here. And then God will have a people who will be ready to stand in the last day. A people like Revelation says, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. You say, Pastor, you're saying something that's impossible. You know, there's this idea, you know, we can't overcome sin before Jesus comes. It's not possible. Do you know when people say that, you know what they're really saying? They're really saying that God is not powerful enough to give you the victory over sin. And they're saying that your flesh is more powerful than God. Do you believe that your sinful tendencies are more powerful than God? Well, that's what people say. I'm going to continue sinning until Jesus comes because the sinful tendencies are there. They'll only be removed when Jesus comes. So God understands that we can't gain the victory over sin. The fact is, when you say that you can't gain the victory over sin, you're not expressing the weakness of man, but what you're, you're saying that God is not powerful enough to give us victory. And so encased in the most holy place, passages of scripture and prophecy has found what Jesus is doing now and what he wants his people to do now. And we are called upon to present these prophecies to the world in the context of present truth. You want to know what present truth is? It's not rocket science. Just find out where Jesus is and what he's doing. That's present truth. When he was in the camp, present truth was the camp. When he was in the court, present truth was, was the court. When he was in the holy place, present truth was the message of the whole holy place. Now that he's in the most holy place, the message of the most holy place is present truth because present truth is Jesus and where Jesus is, that's present truth. And that's what God has called us upon to proclaim to the world. And I pray to God that where the revival began, the revival will end. In this cradle of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, God is waiting to do great things. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given Bible prophecy as a certain word that we can trust, we can take to the bank. But not only, Lord, are the prophecies that you gave to the disciples absolutely true, but the prophecies that have to do with the preparation for the second coming are just absolutely as true. I ask, Lord, that you will help us to experience revival and reformation. Help us, Lord, to understand prophecy, to study your word with prayer, and then through your power to go out and share with the world these marvelous truths in these last days. We thank you, Father, for having been with us this evening, and we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.